My message today is not complicated, but it will take a little following of the scriptures that we've read and a couple that we have not. We've been journeying with God this year, and the intent is that your journey continue with God throughout all the days of your life. And in light of that, it's kind of important that we begin to think about who Jesus is in a sort of realistic term that we're not accustomed to. We live in a democratic society where the biggest distinctions between persons are made by virtue of socioeconomic status. We don't have royalty, per se, in this country. We have groups of people that function that way, but again, it's usually tied to socioeconomic status. So we distinguish between the very rich and the very poor, because as we all know, riches, while it cannot buy heaven and cannot buy happiness and cannot buy inner peace and cannot buy a lot of things, sometimes it can't even buy health. But we do know that riches can buy status, can collect and amass power, and can demonstrate through possessions a sort of superiority that we've all bought into to one degree or another. None of us would consider the $65 million mansion on a par with that little tin hovel at the juncture of the 210 and, five, uh, 210 and 118, for example, as you're coming up the 210. If you look up the crevice, there's a little tin shack that somebody has built and lives in right there in the cleft of the mountain. Nobody would equate those. Nobody would say that the person who lives there is the same or as important, they might in theory, but certainly not in practice, as the person who owns and lives in the $65 million mansion. In fact, we all have an economic system that gives value to time. So if uh, I were to die a death that was sudden and somebody's fault, and they were trying to figure out what the settlement of my life might look like, it probably wouldn't be a great deal of money monetarily. Whereas somebody who makes many times what I do, their life might be valued considerably more. I make this point because Jesus doesn't value socioeconomic status. He looks at things quite differently. He does hang out with people who have money, but he also hangs out with poor and outcast people. More than that, we don't have a royal system. So there is very little birthright that establishes us into anything except, again, functionally, socioeconomically. If your parent is connected and powerful, it is generally considered an advantage to you. We do have sort of dynastic families in this country. You might think of a few right off the bat. The Kennedys, the Bushes, the Dulleses, the Roosevelts. We've had some dynastic families, and we've had wealthy Americans connected to British royalty, buying titles, as it were. Some of you may have seen the uh, uh, Smithsonian Channel special on Million Dollar Brides from the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century, bearing, uh, bailing out the aristocracy of England that was broke but could provide title. So we're not used to thinking in terms of loyalty to country or king or queen in the same way that people who have a monarchy are. In fact, most of us rarely give the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag anymore. There was a time, most of you probably remember, in school where every morning you pledged the flag, you had a prayer, and you went on with your day. And that was how life was. But today we don't think about allegiances in those terms very much. Indeed, the American civilization, as we know it, is deeply involved in the honoring and worship of self. It's about me. 
greghonus at me.org.com.net.whatever. Me. MySpace. It's all about me. Now I know that's old. Nobody uses MySpace anymore. But anyway, I thought that was telling at the time. In Israel, at the time that Jesus is living, there's still kingly, kingly bloodlines. And there's still recognition of that royalty, but the Jews have been scattered to the four corners of the world. They're dominated and, and run over. We do know that in the Roman system, it eventually came to the point where Romans, the, the, the Caesars were treated as gods. And if you didn't worship them, which the early Christians didn't, about 100 AD, it became a problem to the point that the emperor began to persecute Christians because they wouldn't worship the cult of the emperor. They wouldn't put a king before a god. So as foreign as all of this is, one of the things we need to know about our God is that one of the primary metaphors that applies to God is king and lord. These are not titles that we're familiar with. But what we need to kind of get our heads around is that a king and a lord often rule absolutely. Whatever the king institutes is law becomes law. That's the historical pattern. There might be a senate that deals with law in the case of Roman times, and those laws might even govern some of the actions of the Caesar. That would be sort of like our presidential system today a little bit. But more commonly, kings had absolute power. When we read about stories like Daniel and the kings that he served, all of them had more or less absolute power. The only time we find that that isn't the case is that Darius is forced to honor the codes of the Medes and Persians in terms of the execution orders given for Daniel. And so he throws Daniel into the lion's den. God overrides that order because God is a greater king than Darius ever could be. Greater king than Xerxes or Artaxerxes could ever be. Certainly greater than their predecessors, Nabopolassar, Nebuchadnezzar, and so forth. We're not used to thinking in terms of service to the king either. But you can see it in the movies, you can see it even in today. The British maintain a royalty. Uh, it's, there's function to that, although there's not a great deal of political power to that. There's still a great deal of wealth and status connected with that and service to England and so forth. But there used to be a time when, when the king or queen entered, you didn't just stand out of respect. You knelt and bowed your head. You did not look in the face of royalty. You might, after you had been accepted into an audience or into a court, but you were inferior automatically by virtue of birth, you were inferior by virtue of wealth, and you were inferior by virtue of power, and you were definitely inferior by virtue of status. And not only was there kings and lords, but many of them stood not just as heads of political and military power, but many of them stood as heads of religious and spiritual power as well. They were priestly kings. And so not only did they preside over the courts and over the warfare and over the governance of the land, but religious matters as well. Why is this relevant? Okay, you... You're saying to yourself, I know this, I studied sixth grade history. Uh, come on, pastor, give me a break. Okay, I'm telling you all this, reminding you of all of this, because when we see Jesus riding in on a donkey or a colt full of a donkey, we think in our heads that this really isn't very significant. It looks kind of homespun, spontaneous. It's rather poor, really, when you get right down to it. There's no wealth. There's no immediate and obvious power. The Jewish monarchy has been dead for a long time. What does this event mean? Well, I just bring this up because I want us to think 
not in terms of Jesus as somebody that we can't deal with or approach, because he's already said he calls us friend and brother, sister, whatever we are. So he has done a great deal to, to bridge the gap between God and humanity, not only by being our earthly high priest and heavenly high priest, being our Savior and Lord, but being our brother. And he's also our friend. But in modern times, because we don't have categories for royalty and what all that means, we tend to think of God in terms of friendship or brotherhood rather than lordship and kingship. And we're ignoring a big part of what God is and who God is as he functions in our lives and in the universe. You see, as friendly as we might get with God, we are never God. Categorically, we are never God. We may be made in the image of God, after the likeness of God, imbued with the breath of God, given certain powers by God. We may exercise Lord-like dominion, we may have uh, aspiring thoughts, but categorically we can never be anything but creature. There can only be creator and creature. There can only be God King, created vassal, servant friend. And so... I just simply want to remind us that when we think about our relationship with God, it's not like a human buddy. It's not somebody who's our social equal. It's not somebody that we should take the power of for granted. It's not, holy fire is not something to be messed with. Let me repeat that. Holy fire is not something to trifle with. Most of us have the good sense to stay away from things that are demonic or things that are under evil control. We avoid, hopefully, hopefully, we're avoiding occult-type things. You're not playing with Ouija boards and doing other stupid stuff. Hopefully, you're staying away from, you know, this entire genre of horror and vampire stuff. And yeah, there, I, don't, I don't see much God in all of that. But just as you wouldn't play with something evil... Most of us don't think about the power on the other side and how in so many stories we read in Scripture, God doesn't play either. I don't say this to frighten us, to make us uncomfortable. I say this because I think we need to tip the balance a little bit away from a sort of taking for granted God as Savior and friend, and not realizing that God is King and Lord. And that means He exercises dominion over all things, including you and me, over all lives, including yours and mine, and that our position relative to King and Lord is privileged. This is the beauty of the Christian gospel. We are privileged in ways that I know of no other religion offering its its adherence. We have direct access to the throne of God. We have a mediator at God's side who is Christ the Lord. We have one who has been with us and knows our weaknesses and infirmities and advocates for us and understands us. We have one who understands flesh and human form. We have so many gifts in the Christian tradition surrounding who God is in terms of what he has done. And this is why we call Christ's coming the great condescension. Immortality takes on mortality. God taking on flesh, dwelling among us, being one of us. And humankind, for the most part, being too blind to see it when it was right in front of their faces. We're too blind. We miss it many times when it's right in front of our faces. So with that background and context, I just want to look at our, our, our text today to help us in this journey. The first one was the call to worship, and I'm going to take them in the order that they were read. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Think about all the kings who went foul following David 
and dishonored the Lord and brought idolatry to Israel. Think of all the kings who failed to serve God properly, who killed the prophets, who brought curses upon the land. The days are coming when I will raise up in David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Now, David, or excuse me, Jeremiah here, was being prophetic. And most people who read this prophecy thought, yes, our Savior from the Romans will be somebody who comes and does what is right, who will reunite the kingdom and bring back the glory days of Solomon. But that wasn't to be. Looking at it from our lens, from our vantage point in time and history, we can see Jeremiah is speaking to something else. He's speaking of a righteous king, one who will be known as Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament reading has its interests as well. I'm not an expert at Hebrew, so I really wonder in this if the translation of nine is entirely correct because there's a confusion of the genders there. But Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hands will be on the neck of your enemies. Obviously, you've got him in a stranglehold. And who is, who is speaking, by the way? Do you know who's speaking in Genesis 49 when he says, Judah, your brothers will praise you? Jacob. It is Israel who is speaking. Remember, Jacob has wrestled with God and his name has been changed. And now Israel is giving his sons a blessing, all of them in Genesis 49. And when he comes to Judah, the blessing that he gives him is this. And I love the blessings of Scripture, by the way. I thought what Alex said was so powerful a few minutes ago because here our senior most member is offering a blessing to the congregation in the biblical tradition. That's powerful. That's meaningful. It carries great spiritual weight. And, and Israel is blessing his sons. Judah, your brothers, you will, you'll be admired by your brothers and praised by them. You're going to have your enemies in a stranglehold. You'll be powerful. Your father's sons, he comes back to it, will bow to you. And then he goes on to the lion's cub illustration. You're a lion's cub, you return from the prey, my son. He describes cub, male, and female lions. Now, if you've ever observed these in film or in the wild, lions are incredibly big, scary cats. Male lion head is like, it's huge. And those jaws, you just don't even want, want to face them. Now, African lions are bigger than perhaps the ones that were in the Middle East and certainly bigger than the ones uh, that were in, in other parts of the world that are not, not there anymore, European lions and so forth. But fearsome creatures, who dares to rouse them? The scepter will not depart Judah. This is the signal of uh, the, the symbol of rain, the scepter nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of all the nations shall be his. In other words, he's going to reign and reign forever. Now we get to Jesus. Again, a prophecy. Israel is prophesying, and he doesn't necessarily know it. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch, He'll wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. And that is what wine is, a symbol of blood sometimes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Quite a blessing. Quite a blessing. And then we get to the New Testament reading in Timothy. And I'm just bumping along here. Hope we're not missing much. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus. Did you catch that phrase? Timothy is saying, in the sight of God, and he doesn't leave it at that. He reminds us 
who gives life to everything. Primary, secondary. Source, object. Who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus. Very interesting phrase to follow. Who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. What was that good confession that is being referenced there? Well, if you turn to Matthew 26. Jesus is before the Sanhedrin in verse 62. But I'm going to start in verse 63. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Now that was not a trivial thing. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And here's Jesus' confession, verse 64. You have said so. Can you imagine the stunned silence in the room? Part of the, the audience who heard this was gleeful because this was finally proof of the blasphemy that would secure his fate. Now they could be rid of this nuisance in Israel. But that's also a stunning confession to make. I am he. Echoes back to the very existence of God who is the I am. And Jesus goes on in Matthew's account in 64, But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's the good confession. Not only is he the Messiah, but he's the Son of God, and he sits at the right hand of God. And while we don't make much significance of right or left anymore, to sit at the right hand of somebody was to sit in a seat of trust and primary power. When Pharaoh appointed Joseph over the land, he placed him at his right hand. He was number one in the land except for the Pharaoh. And when Jesus sits at the right hand of God, he is number one, and with God, and of God, and God. And so we see this picture now of Jesus in a moment of trial, prefiguring hours of agony, but he is now declaring his power. You have said so, but from now on, it's going to be obvious from now on, you're going to see me sitting in seats of power in high places. You're going to see me returning to where I've come from. This good confession, Timothy goes on, the, the text, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, will, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler... <laughs> And here's a title we're not used to either. King of kings and Lord of lords, the highest of the highest, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, except this son who sits at his right hand, of course. To him be honor and might or power forever. This is a kingdom that does not end. This is a kingdom where righteousness is established forever. This is a kingdom that we can't categorically reach or understand. And then we get to our gospel. The same Jesus who makes this confession before the Sanhedrin is coming to the end of his life. He knows it and nobody around him knows it. As the disciples and Jesus approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, 
and will send it back here shortly. It wasn't stealing it, it was borrowing it for the day. And as brought out in our children's story, the colt has never been ridden. So in one last act of miraculous mastery, Jesus has already demonstrated that he can calm the seas, calm the winds. The winds and the waves obey him. He's already demonstrated that he can take a small meal and feed 4,000 and feed 5,000. He's already demonstrated mastery over every kind of illness. He's already demonstrated mastery over death. And in one last gesture, he's going to ride an unbroken animal, and it will not buck him. They went out and found the colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, sure enough, some people said, what are you doing untying the colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. I don't know how many of us realize the value of animals in a pre-car world, but a knight's horse in medieval times would cost about as much as a car costs today. These animals were highly prized, highly trained, highly valued, and incredibly useful. And in the Middle East as well, these burden animals carried things from place to place and people. We find Mary, when she's pregnant, riding on a donkey to be with Joseph in Bethlehem as the census is taken. Jesus' word is enough for people to let this valuable animal go. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, a chivalrous sort of act that everything should be paved properly and gloriously for a coming king. He sat on the colt, colt and many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Some translations say they waved palm branches and sang hosannas and spread the road with palm branches. They were welcoming their coming king. Those went ahead of him who followed, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna to God in the highest! Echoing the praises that were sung by angels when Jesus was born, echoing the sentiments of the prophets who had foretold one would rise in the line of Jesse, that David's kingdom would be reestablished forever. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went to Bethany with the twelve. That day, they welcomed one who was really king of the Jews. His bloodline was royal. He was stepping into a role that they didn't understand at the time, but thought they understood at the time. He was to be the new king of Israel. Rome didn't take kindly to it, and the Sanhedrin had already decided his death or was, were, were, excuse me, were seeking means to accomplish his death and the blasphemy we read about earlier was the perfect way to do that. My sermon title today is Beware the Fickle Crowd. I don't know if that's the exact title, but that's the intent of it. The crowd that is cheering is the crowd that will one day soon be jeering. That's us. We welcome somebody into our lives or into our presence and honor them as a hero and we forget them or disavow them or move on the next day. We have a culture of throwaway. It's fun to watch how long or observe how long a child might actually play with a given toy at Christmas. Probably long enough to get to the next toy and it's soon forgotten. All that joy, all that energy, all that desire dissipated so quickly. I know I have to give him money if I reference him, but my son used to prefer to play with the boxes sometimes to the toys themselves. 
Any of you have kids who liked the boxes better than the toys? Yeah, sure. More imagination, more ways to do things. But we live in a throwaway culture, and we're used to things changing all the time. And we're fickle in different ways, perhaps, than those people that day. But that person that they honored and saluted and hailed as king, this one who came in the name of the Lord, the one to whom they shouted hosannas, that same person stood in chains, beaten and abused, while they shouted, give us Barabbas, not five days later. Barabbas the insurrectionist. Barabbas the, the criminal. As was the custom of the time, Pontius Pilate would release to the one prisoner, and they didn't demand that they release Jesus, this kind, noble, gentle person who had healed and touched the lives of so many, who had preached them, had preached to them such profound sermons, had helped them see reality entirely differently. This one whom they had just hailed as their king. And they shouted, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Beware the cheering crowd because the cheering crowd becomes the jeering crowd. And the fickleness of humanity is revealed in this story. So in this season, my plea to you, is to welcome the coming king, but not for a day or two or five, but forever. Have some sense of who it is that has come to us and who it is that we're welcoming and who it is that we're dealing with. He's not trivial. He's not small. He's not weak. He's not in any sense inferior. He's not even in any sense truly an equal. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, ruler not just of a country or a province or a city-state or even a world, but of a universe and all that is. That is the God that we connect to. That is the God we have the privilege of loving, of knowing, of serving, of partnering with, of becoming more and more like King of Kings. King of the Jews, King of all.